When my life work is ended and I've crossed the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, by the print of the nails in His hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view His blessed face, and the luster of His kindly beaming eye. How my full heart will praise Him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepare for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know of the nails in his hand. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come, and our parting at the river I recall. To the sweet vales of Eden they will sing and welcome home, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hand. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, for the sake of time, I'll begin reading at verse 17, 16. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether they be wood therein or not, and be ye of a good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came to Hebron, where Ahimen, Shebron, where Ahibron, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. 
And they came unto the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called Brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. I want to focus in on verse 18 there. Now here, obviously, the names are listed of those that had come and were sent to spy out the land. And Moses gives the charge unto them, in verse 17, get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein. Sermon title is, What It Is. What it is. He charges them to see it. <laughs> he charges them to be courageous not in their own selves but in the spirit and power of god go see what it is and here we find god proving them turn over to deuteronomy chapter 8 deuteronomy chapter 8 now i don't believe that this was necessarily god's ultimate plan for them was that they would go and spy out the land nevertheless he moved them to do so in order to prove them as he often does whether they will serve the lord god and whether they will love the lord god or no deuteronomy chapter 8 this is nothing new to god this is how he works deuteronomy 8 and verse 2 it says and thou shalt remember all the way which the lord thy god led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And so his proving, and his challenges, and his trials of his people are to humble them and so that they would know and that he would know whether they would serve him or not. He challenges them to prove them, prove what was in their hearts to him, though he knew that. More importantly, I think, to prove what was in their own hearts to themselves, that they would know that. And to enforce and reinforce to them that you live by the word of God, not by the provisions that you have. What it is then is not all that important but who he is now when manna fell as we know if we read back to the the portion of scripture that deuteronomy here is referring to when manna fell it was named manna for a specific reason they said what is it and that's what manna means what is it i don't know what it is so they called it manna for they wist not what it was hmm i don't know what is that i don't know Nevertheless, as men often do, they proceed to describe exactly what it is. And this, this is a good side of men and in our inquisitiveness and in our, our wanting to seek some things out. It's also, though it's positive, it's a negative side of us that we always need to find out what it is and seek things out and find out a manner. It can be both a positive or a negative. What quite often is a positive in your life is also the double-edged sword that is the worst aspect of your life. Right? My strengths are often my greatest weaknesses. So they said, it's manna, for they wist not what it was. But then they proceeded it, to describe it. If you were to go back, you would find them saying, it, it was like coriander seed, white. The taste was as a wafer made with honey. And so they didn't know what it was. They called it, I don't know what it is. But then they proceeded to try to discover what exactly it was by the only way that men can. Right? Science ought to be just like this, based only on what we can touch, feel, taste, smell, observe, and repeat, right? And that's what they did with manna. They still didn't understand it, but they could see what it was and how it was used. They received manna. They received the provision of God. And unfortunately, these did it first by fact, rather than receiving it by faith. We as men always want to have all the facts. We're, we're, we often refuse to jump into a command of God until we have all the details lined up. We refuse to obey 
the word until we understand everything fully. We want to know what it is before we'll actually believe it and trust it and act upon it by faith. But God wants us to know, as the second half of verse 3 says there in Deuteronomy 8, He wants us to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He wants us to know things by what God says. And that takes faith. We're trusting a God that we've never seen and a voice that we've never heard. By faith. Too often we as Christians stumble at the what it is point. We want to figure out what it is when it comes to our salvation or the Lord's gifts. Right? Because salvation can be both your eternal soul and also just every day. God saves us from things. Right? Regarding the Lord's gifts, we need to figure out what it is before we're actually going to receive it. Regarding the promised land, we want to know what it is. The Lord's will before we'll actually receive it and do it. Regarding heaven and the Lord's provision, we want to know what it is before we'll receive it. We often need the facts before we'll take things by faith. This is what God wants. Hey, I said it, believe it, act upon it. Too often God says it before we believe it. We want to figure it all out and align it and understand it and know what it is before we'll, okay, not believe it, but receive it, accept it. And then we'll act, not on faith, but on facts. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We don't often need, we don't always need to know what it is before we just behave and act accordingly. Sometimes I say, well, let me first see what it is before I'll receive the gift of God. <clears throat> Salvation indeed is a gift. Too often people get skeptical about the gift of God, which is eternal life. You'll hear them say, well, nothing in this world is free. And I say, yeah, that's right. Salvation is out of this world. So that's why it's free. Nothing in this world is free. There's got to be some strings attached. I need to know what it is before I will receive it. I need to understand it fully. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we often need to have all the facts. Go to Roman, or John chapter 3. We often need to have all the facts before we'll receive it. How often have you preached to somebody... And they believe and understand and receive everything, but then there will always be some minute detail that they don't comprehend, and so they'll throw out all of God's gift because they need to know what it is before they'll receive it. I'm reminded of a story. I was, I was called by a gentleman who had been ministered to by other, other people at other churches that we know of, and this gentleman could not receive of the gift of God no matter whom gave it to him, because he couldn't understand what it is. And his what it is was, what in the world happened in those three days and three nights? I know that Christ died for my sins. I know that he was raised for my justification. But what happened in the grave? What happened in hell? What happened in those three days and three nights when, as Jonah put it, he was in the depths of the earth, right? I need to know that or I can't receive any of it. And so I highlighted to him, well, the Bible's clear. Salvation is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried. And he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I'm like, look, the burial is like a segue between what the Scriptures are talking about and highlighting. And if you read the Bible, it's clear. It says the death, according to the Scriptures. He says the resurrection, according to the Scriptures. And it's like a segue in between. I'm like, don't you think God would give us a lot more Scriptures and highlight that it's according to the Scriptures if He needed us to know every single detail in order for us to receive of the death and of the resurrection? Don't you think He'd give us some clarity? He's like, yeah, I, I think He would. I'm like, so don't reject it just because you don't know what it is in regard to the point here in God's gift and provision of eternal life. Do you believe he died for you? Yes. Do you believe he spent three days and three nights in the grave? Yes. Do you believe he rose again triumphant to save your soul? Yes, I do. Then believe him and ask him and receive that gift of God from him. <clears throat> I said to him, look, when, when Mary and, and Martha and Peter went to find Jesus during those three days, where did they go? To the grave. Well, then that's what you got to believe he went to. 
They didn't go searching in the heart of the earth. They didn't go searching in the depths of the, of the, of the, of the earth and the, the, the deep of the valleys or, or the mountains of, of underwater places that Jonah talked about. No, they went to the grave, and that's where Christ went. Believe that and trust that. In John chapter 3, we have another man, Nicodemus, who needed to see what it is before he would receive of the gift. John 3 verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus here, he's not understanding this fact of being born again. He needs to understand and comprehend what Jesus is talking about here. He says, I know you're a teacher. I know that you are sent from God because of the miracles that I have seen But this whole being born again thing, it doesn't make sense. I haven't seen it. I don't understand it. I reject it, is where he is right now. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and life eternal. If Nicodemus needs, if Nicodemus wants to receive of the gift of God, eternal life, he needs to receive it spiritually. And yet he's here stuck trying to find out what it is. I need to, I need to figure out what it is before we can move on. Jesus says, you're missing it. You're being carnally minded in a spiritual truth here, Nicodemus. Jesus answered, verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This verse gets convoluted and confused a lot, but the next verse highlights exactly what he's talking about. Verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Born of water is being born of the flesh. Born of the Spirit is being born of the Spirit, of course. God here just makes it plain and clear. you got to be born of the flesh. you got to be a living person. you got to be here in this. I can touch you. I can behold you. You're alive. You're born of the flesh, right? But you must also be born of the Spirit. Nicodemus had spent his whole religious life walking in a birth that was completely flesh, completely carnal. He needed to be also born of the Spirit, in order to be saved. How, how, how can this happen? Continue on in verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. He's saying, don't marvel at this truth. Verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whether it cometh or whence it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. In other words, you can't see the change, but you can definitely see the effect that it has made. Everyone that is born of the Spirit has to receive of that the same way. Nicodemus answered and said, How can these things be? What is this? What is it? He, this is Nicodemus' manna. I don't know what it is. I need to figure it out. Nicodemus ends up as one of those that is ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because he will not receive of what God is giving him by faith. He will not receive of the gift of God. And Jesus notices this. Verse 10, he says, Art thou a master of Israel, and knoweth not these things? You, you, are, you know everything about this. But he knows it fleshly. He knows it carnally. He knows it word by word, fact by fact, but he is not received it by faith. Verse 11, Christ continues to press. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. You see Jesus calling himself God there? People say that that's not in the Bible, but he just says, the Son of Man in heaven. He's standing in front of him in the flesh, as it were, while presently standing in heaven. Like another thing, I need to know what it is before I receive it. No, you just need to understand that that's the truth. Christ walked this earth as a man and stood in heaven. as the Son of Man. Simultaneously. But how shall you believe if I'm telling you 
physical things, if I'm telling you earthly things, how shall you ever believe the heavenly things that I'm trying to show unto you? It's Christ's charge here. And like I said, I've seen people who will not receive the gift of God because they don't understand all the facts. But we know that the gospel is simple and it's to be received with the faith of a child. Children understand things very simplistically. Children also understand things without reservation. You can tell a kid something and they just buy it, hook, line, and sinker, right? So if you tell a child or somebody that's receiving salvation as a child, it ought to be the same way. Death, burial, resurrection, that was for you. Believe it and receive it. It ought to come the same way, but too often people need to know what it is before they'll receive it. They want the facts. They need faith. What do they need to believe? Verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. They need to believe in Christ. They need to believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. They need to believe on him who died and shed his blood for him in order to be saved. Too often we need to know what it is before we'll receive of God's gifts. Next thing is the promised land. Let me first see what it is before I'll receive of the promised land. You know what the promised land of the Old Testament is likened unto in the New? It's our Christian walk in the will of God. We need to enter into the promised land of God's will. You know why it's the promised land? Because when you do, God says he will bless, he will care, he will provide, he will do all those things as is highlighted over and over and over again in Deuteronomy. When you obey and trust him and believe him and do what he says, that's when God really starts to work in your life. The promised land of God's will needs to be jumped into by faith, not simply needing facts and needing to know what it is before you go there. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, <clears throat> God had already said what it is. And yet here we read... The spies went to spy out the land. Well, why? Couldn't they have just lived upon the word of God? Believed the word of God? And followed after God's will? No, because the heart of man needs to know what it is before they'll get into God's will. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 7, it says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. God had already pr promised what the land was. It was a land where there is no lack. It was a land where there is no scarceness. It was also a land that was theirs to take. Look over in chapter 11 of Deuteronomy in verse 22. It was a wonderful land. It was a plentiful land. It was a blessed land. It was, it was, it was more than they could ever ask for, much more than they deserved given to God, that promised land, given by God, that promised land. Deuteronomy 11 in verse 22 he says, For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea coast shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon as he hath said unto you. So God's promised land is promised to be theirs. They simply have to take it. There is no scarceness. There is no lack. But yet they doubted in the promise. Now, we understand as we read through Numbers chapter 13 there, 
that it was a good land, that it was promised unto them. And you can go back to Numbers chapter 13. That it was exactly as God had said, nevertheless, instead of taking it, instead of believing God's word about it, they needed to go find out what it is. In Numbers chapter 13 and verse 26, what did they find? And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. Surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwelleth in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. So they went and found the good land. They went and said, it's exactly as God promised. Nevertheless, they saw a problem there and therefore didn't receive it. They did not believe that it was theirs to take. They said plainly that it's walled. They said plainly that the cities are very great. They said plainly that there is a strong enemy dwelling in the land and they forgot for the problem that was before them. They saw the problem and forgot that God had promised it to be theirs. Verse 30 said, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. He had that right spirit. He had that good spirit, that faithful spirit that said, God promised a good land would be ours. We are able to possess it if we just go. Verse 31 said, but the man that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report unto the land, which they searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. So they doubted the promise because they saw the problem that was in front of them. Now, in our Christian walk, as we try to get into the will of God, trust me, you will always find challenges. You will always find trials. You will always find struggles as you enter into the will of God. But that's why you need to rest on, plant your feet on, build upon the rock that is the word of God so that you can proceed into these things and not fall when these challenges are before you. When God sent them to spy out the land, certainly he knew that the children of Anak were there. Certainly he also knew that the, they would find a plentiful land flowing with milk and honey. But he had hoped and trusted in them that they would look past the people to the plentiful promise of God, and they didn't. Now, when we're entering into the will of God, we ought to be like Caleb. Let's go up at once. Let's possess the promise that God made. We're able to overcome whatever challenges God puts before us when he promises us to, to, to do something in, in his will. But look what often happens. Instead of acting in faith upon the promise of God, we go, well, what is it? What is God wanting us to do? What's the challenge that's before us? And we start to think things through. And eventually, if we think things through long enough, we rationalize and look at the look like the children of Israel. Instead of accepting the promise and possessing it, we go, look at all these problems. Look what's standing in front of us, God. Look at the challenges that are here. We cannot go against them. And honestly, in their own might, they couldn't. But God had promised that they would overcome it simply by walking into the land and accepting it. He had a will for them and they refused it because the problem became bigger than the promise of God. And in Christian life, the Christian victory, that promised land of victory to overcome your sins, to overcome your struggles and your challenges, to overcome the, the, the wiles of the devil and the problems that he throws in your path, you need to get there by faith. God's will for you is that you would overcome and succeed. You got to get there by faith and not worry about the ins and outs and the finer points. Not try to find out what it is before you get into God's will. Just jump into God's will and allow Him to take care of the details. We often want to first see what it is when it comes to the salvation of God. How's God going to get me out of this mess? How God? How's God going to save my soul? How's God going to save my marriage? How's God going to save my relationships? How's He going to save my family? We want all these details. What is it? Just receive it by faith and know that God promised some things. The promised land or God's will is the same way. We want to know what it is. What does God want me to do in all the finest points instead of just saying, God, 
your will be done. Let me, let me get into your will by faith. Let me follow after you best I know how and you take care of the rest. Let me first see what it is when it comes to heaven or the promises of God. Now here, the provision of God is our food, is our raiment, is our, 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 our home at a minimum, right? God promises to provide those things for us. He's never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. David said that when he was old and well stricken in years. You'll always have food. You'll always have raiment. That is the provision of God. But we also look forward to something that he's providing us in heaven, don't we? He's gone to prepare a place for us, prepare a mansion for us over there. There's something so much greater. And we read of it. We read of a place that's called heaven. A glorious place. How beautiful heaven must be, the hymnal records. And we often think about that. How beautiful heaven must be, the home of the happy and free, a fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. But sometimes we get bogged down in the what it is instead of just looking forward to the fact that we're going to go there one day. We read of that place. We try to find out all the ins and outs of it. Why can't we just believe that God has provided for us something that is far beyond our understanding? And you know what happens when we start to rationalize what heaven's like and get all the ins and outs? What is it? What it is? We, I want to know. I need to know. You know what happens? Down here, we get discouraged, tired. Because my only framework for what's going on in heaven is what I see here. When I think of a mansion here, I think of a great big house with a hundred rooms and, and four car garages and cars in it. And I'm just like, this is great. But then I'm like, oh man, now I got to clean it. And I got to vacuum it. And now I got to pay this. And I got to do that. I gotta, uh, and that's, that becomes my framework for heaven. And then next thing you know, I'm more concerned with what it is than I am with the fact that God has prepared. I guarantee you a heaven, heavenly mansion is a lot different than the earthly mansions. Those are vanity and waste, right? There's something there that we can't even comprehend. So why can't we just let it alone that we can't even comprehend it? Just say, heaven is manna. I don't even know what it is. But you know what we do? Heaven is manna. I don't know what it is, but it's a coriander seed, and it's like this, and it's like that, and it tastes like this, and it's like that. We try to scientifically break down what we think heaven might be. And do you know what that leads us to here? Discouragement. We get tired, we get sad, we get defeated, we get hopeless because our framework for heaven is what's going on here. So our best day is what we think of when we think of heaven and our best day is not that great, right? We walk through some of our best days still with pain, with sadness, with anger, with anguish, right? But heaven is so much greater. So let me see first what it is or why don't we just trust that God has provided it it's waiting for us and it's ready for us and just look forward to the time when we can receive it. We see what we have here and it's so little. And we start to focus on our lack that is here. And then we start to think that heaven is this place that's full of little and lack. Now it's true that the details of heaven seem minimal. And we can't grasp fully all the things that are to behold there. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would, in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul describes a man that was caught up to the third heaven, as it were. I think this was him. I think he was just talking uh, poetically, perhaps. Verse 12, or verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory i will come to visions and revelations of the lord i knew a man in christ about 14 years ago whether in the body i cannot tell or whether out of the body i cannot tell god knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven and i knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body i cannot tell god knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So here Paul, given an opportunity to expound upon the greatness of heaven, simply says, I was caught up, or I knew a man that was caught up unto paradise, unto the third heaven, and heard words there, unspeakable words, which is not even lawful for a man to utter. In other words, he couldn't even find a reasonable way, a proper way to explain what was seen there in paradise and in heaven. 
And so instead of trying to figure out what it is and trying to take all this opportunity and time to just expound on the inner workings of heaven and what he saw and what he did, he mentioned it and then began to expound upon other things. Only in brief, in passing, he talked about how great heaven was and then continued on talking about the sufferings that he has encountered as a result of being here. And you can see as he, if he was to lose track of what heaven is, conceptually, the provision of God. God's great dwelling place where he lives, where he wants us to dwell. And he was to get wrapped up with the finer details of it. He might start to compare heaven with what he's experiencing here including a messenger from Satan to buffering, buffet him, including great trials and afflictions, where God says his grace is sufficient for him. He might get bogged down with these things. But heaven is so much greater than we can even imagine. If you go to Revelation 21 at the end of your Bible, so much greater than we can imagine. So why do we try to imagine it? Why can't we just by faith understand and accept that it is there for us? It is the greatest thing we could ever receive of God is provision of a heavenly place to dwell with him. Revelation 21 and verse 1, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Now look at that. It's coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and shall be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Here in heaven he talks about how the old is passed away and new enters in but the focus of John goes from that holy city and the provision of God unto who? comes from the God. He, he, he starts to focus on the tabernacle of God that is with men, that he will dwell with them and he shall be his, he shall be with his people and God himself shall be with them and shall be their God. And then God begins to wipe away their tears and God becomes the central focus of everything that's going on. We want to know what it is when it comes to heaven and we figure, we, we lose track of who it is that gave it to us. And that becomes our problem and our shortcoming when it comes to our dealings with heaven. Certainly, it ought to give us hope to think about that place. Certainly, certainly, it ought to give us, give us a joy to think about when that comes. But it ought to give us just as much joy to know that we will be with Him. And this becomes our struggle. What is it? What is it? What is it? And every time we try to go and figure out what it is before we receive it, we'll end up like the people of Israel. and We lose track of the promise for the for, for the items that we're going to receive when we enter into that land. When we start to think about heaven, we lose track of the Father and God himself, and we start to focus on what we will receive there. Let me first see what it is before I'll accept it. We struggle to know the manna. We struggle to know what God is providing for us, and we lose track of the fact that he has provided it for us. Shouldn't that be our focus? And what happens, again, they focused on the manna. They focused on all the ways that they could prepare the manna. They focused on all the, way, all the different things that they could do with it, what it was, what it, what it served well in, how they could prepare it, how, how they, and eventually they became loathful of the very thing that God provided for them. I think that can happen to us here. Become loathful of what God has provided for us because, because we're losing track of the God that provided it. Revelation 22. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruits every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of all nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of his Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, 
and they shall reign with him forever and ever. And he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto the servants things which must shortly be done. The Bible says that the lamb shall be in it. They shall see his face. And I think in these three areas of what it is, we need to focus on God more than everything. What is it? What is your salvation? What is your provision? What have you done? What will you do? What, what can you do in my life to make it better? How can you save me from hell? How can you do this? How can you do that? The focus is supposed to be believing on Christ and just trusting him with all those details, isn't it? What is it when it comes to God's will? How am I going to get there? What am I going to do? What am I going to pay for? How am I going to, going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to get into God's will? What is God's will? Just follow God. Trust Him. That's the promised land. Trust and obey. Take it by faith. Heaven, what's it like? I need to know what it's like. I need to be able to describe it. I need to be able to draw it. I need to be able to see it. You're missing the fact that it's God that's there and provided for it. Don't you think He knows what you have need of? Don't you think he knows what would bring you greatest joy? He's arranged for it there. He's got in that mansion exactly what you need, exactly what you would want, exactly what would bring you the greatest of joy. All I'm trying to say is let's not focus so much on what it is. What is going on? What, what do I need to do? What, focus more on God. Trust him. Follow him. Seek him. And let him be your every thought, your every hope, your every dream. The details. We get bogged down in the details, don't we, as men? I think I do that too often. How beautiful heaven must be, but I think it'll be greatest because God is there. Amen? Thank you, Father, for this day, Lord. Help us not to get so stressed out about trying to understand